thank you all for joining us for our webinar on exploring surrogacy options. This is our first webinar of 2014. My name is Brian Manning. I'm the Communications Manager here at Circle Surrogacy. On today's webinar panel, we've got a great panel lined up. We have Alicia Imperato, who's one of the social workers here at Circle. She's going to talk a little bit about our different programs and how we screen and match surrogates. Dean Hutchinson, one of our attorneys here, is going to talk a little bit about the legal work and the financial aspects. We're going to have Dr. Sahakian from Pacific Fertility Center Los Angeles talk about the medical aspects of surrogacy. And then finally, we'll have Brian, one of our parents, share his own personal experience. Again, to sort of just a brief overview of what we've got planned, uh, we'll talk a little bit about the history of, of our agency, some background, cover the difference between gestational surrogacy and gestational surrogacy with egg donation, or GSED, cover our process and our programs, discuss the legal work involved in surrogacy, as well as the cost and insurance, um, go over the medical process, and finally hear from a, an experienced parent through surrogacy. Just a little bit of housekeeping before we start. Uh, you should see a panel like this to the right of your screen. Um, to listen in, you can use your phone or your computer speakers. Um, you should know that you're on mute, so we can't hear anything that you're saying. But if you want to ask us a question, there is a questions panel where you can enter. You can type, type them in, and we'll get to them at the end of the webinar. I also wanted to let you know that we're, we'll be recording the webinar and we'll email it to you afterwards. So if you miss anything, don't worry. Um, we'll, we'll get it to you afterwards. Okay, so without further ado, I'm going to pass it on to Alicia Imperato. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for being here with us tonight. As Brian has said, my name is Alicia Imperato. Um, I'm one of the circle uh, social workers here. Um, and I work in the surrogate screening and matching department. Um, before I give you a little bit more information about our program um, and our process, um, I can give you some background on myself. Um, I began my role at Circle immediately following my master's program for clinical social work, wherein the majority of my training was done at a major teaching hospital in Boston. Prior to my experience in social work, I worked as a paralegal at a large international firm um, focused on international arbitration and um, dispute resolution. I've also worked as a paralegal for a number of years for a local estate planning and family law attorney. Um, and as I had mentioned at Circle, my role here um, as a clinical social worker is primarily in the surrogate screening and matching department, wherein I screen potential carriers, um, I evaluate their candidacy in becoming gestational surrogates, and then once they're approved, um, I prepare them for a surrogacy journey. Um, and then we move on to matching with intended parents. Um, as a social worker, I also provide clinical or emotional support to a caseload of gestational carriers who have matched with intended parents. Um, and this emotional support starts in the first month um, of the journey, and it continues through two months postpartum um, after the delivery. And this is one of the aspects of the circle that we're excited to be able to provide to you. Um, as of late, I've also had the opportunity to work with prospective intended parents in consultation, so hopefully I'll have the opportunity to speak with some of you on this webinar at a later date. Um, so let's get started here. Just a, a brief introduction about Circle Surrogacy. Um, we're one of the oldest and largest surrogacy agencies in the world. Um, John Waltman is our president and founder. He's recognized worldwide as an expert in reproductive law, including surrogacy and gay parenting. Um, John began surrogacy legal work in 1992 and um, went on to establish Circle in 1995. Um, John himself is also a father through surrogacy. He has two sons, both in college. Um, some highlights about Circle Surrogacy and our agency um, in particular. So we have nearly 100% um, success rate. And this is on account of intended parents who follow our guidance um, based on almost 20 years of experience. Um, and this includes working with reputable IVF clinics, such as Pacific Fertility Center, um, as Dr. Sahakian will be speaking with you later on tonight. 
Um, PFC in particular knows how to work well with the surrogacy agency, and, and this is um, a great asset. Um, along with Pacific Fertility Center, we're able to offer an unlimited IVF program, um, and this particular feature will be discussed a little bit later tonight. Um, we also have international expertise, um, so that we're able to work with clients from outside of the U.S., um, and the number of countries that we are able to work with continues to grow. Um, in that same vein, we have intended parents from all backgrounds, um, so we have a very diverse group of intended parents. Um, we're able to offer um, the SPAR program to our HIV-positive intended parents. This program is offered through Bedford Labs. Um, Dr. Ann Kiesling is the medical director and founder of this laboratory. Um, again, this is a program that can be discussed in a little bit more detail um, should you decide to move forward with the consultation. Circle surrogacy has an emphasis on known egg donation. Um, that being said, should you decide to choose an anonymous donor, um, that's certainly an option for you, and it's, it's completely up to you know, your family and, and your decision as to you know, what route you take. Um, the reason for known egg donation is simply because you know, we know that as children grow older, um, they ask questions. Um, at a young age, they start asking questions and want to know about their birth story. So having the um, communication lines open with your egg donor um, and being able to reach out to her at a later date is certainly valuable. Um, again, during a consultation, you'll have the opportunity to speak about um, the parameters of this and how this is um, in your contract with your egg donor, um, the degree to which you're able to be in touch with her. Um, we are a relationship-based agency. And that means that we encourage and help to foster your relationship with your surrogate. Um, we encourage at least once a week communication with her. Once the process gets rolling, um, in any way that we can help with that, we certainly do. We provide you support throughout the process. And this is because we are a full service agency. Um, so that allows us to call on the different groups that work within Circle um, to assist you along the way. Um, so those groups include the social work team, um, the legal department, uh, the accounting department, as well as the program coordination department. Um, and the program coordination department I'll speak about in a little bit um, in terms of a specific program coordinator who will work with you from day one of your journey through the birth of your baby or babies. Um, and we also take into account long-term planning. We know the surrogacy journey takes approximately 15 to 22 months. So with your program coordinator, he or she will keep you in line and, and on that track. Uh, three important components of a surrogacy journey um, that are important to consider, the first of which being communication. Uh, communication with your surrogate is paramount. It's very important. And again, as I mentioned, you know, being in touch with her at least once per week throughout the duration of your journey is extremely important. Um, but we also underscore communication with your agency. Um, we want to be in touch with you. Um, we want to be able to provide updates to you and, and be a part of your journey. The second component would be trust, and again, trust between you and your surrogate, um, you being able to trust her, knowing that she's done this before, she's carried her own children before, so she knows what she's doing, and trusting your agency, trusting us. Again, as I mentioned, we have almost 20 years experience um, in this process, um, so we want you to allow us to help you. The last component would be letting go of control. Um, and acknowledging, you know, early on that a journey um, is in a lot of ways out of all of our control. Um, there are things that happen, um, and which is why having an agency behind you to help you out along the way is, is certainly important. So there are two tracks to consider, um, depending on your needs when you sign on with an agency and, and move forward with circle surrogacy. Um, the first would be gestational surrogacy. So in this sense, um, both intended parents are able to provide biology to create embryos, so sperm and egg. Um, and in turn, they require the assistance of a gestational carrier um, to carry that child. Um, if this uh, matches up with your needs, in that regard, what we do is match you with a gestational carrier um, who aligns with your legal, psychological, and emotional needs. Um, the other track is gestational surrogacy with egg donation, or GSED. Um, in this sense, for intended parents who require an egg donor, um, what we do is help you to match with an egg donor, either from our network of donors 
um, Circle Surrogacy has approximately 200 donors um, on their site um, at all times that are available for matching. Um, and we also partner with egg donation agencies um, as well. That can be an option for you. Um, and then similar to gestational surrogacy, we match you with the surrogate. Um, again, that meets your legal, psychological, and emotional needs. Um, so talking about the surrogacy process. So initially what happens is you'd have a consultation with Circle Surrogacy, um, wherein you're able to talk about your specific situation and needs. Um, once you make the decision to sign on with Circle, that entails signing an agreement for services and sending in your first half agency fee. We welcome you. We send you an email. We congratulate you for you know, taking this big step and starting your family or perhaps expanding your family. And at that point, we assign you to a program coordinator. As I mentioned, um, that person that you'll be in touch with at least once a week, walking you through the first steps of your journey all the way to the birth. So your program coordinator's role is threefold. The first um, responsibility your program coordinator has is journey coordination, kind of keeping all the moving pieces of a journey um, in line. Um, your program coordinator is in touch with your surrogate, your egg donor, and your IVF clinic sometimes daily, um, keeping track of the coordination and the moving pieces, making sure that everything is running smoothly. Um, one major duty of your program coordinator is ensuring that your profile is complete. And this happens as soon as you sign on with Circle. Um, the reason that this is so important is once you get to matching with the surrogate, um, your profile is, is her first glimpse into who you are, um, either as a single person or a couple. Um, so you want it to reflect that. You want it to reflect you know, who you are and, and why you're here embarking on this journey. Um, what we encourage for intended parents, if they're able, is to write a letter to your surrogate. Um, at that point, you, you don't know who she is quite yet, um, but you do know somebody is out there who wants to work with you um, and help you move forward in this journey um, of creating a family. Um, the letter is kind of your way of um, you know, telling her how grateful you are um, to have her and, and that she's willing to work with you and, and how excited you are to move forward in this journey. Um, the last important role for the program coordinator at this point is aligning you with a clinic. Um, and the reason why this happens so early on um, is because when we begin considering gestational carriers for you in terms of matching, um, we want to have an IVF doctor we can reach out to directly um, so that he can um, go over her medical records, um, her OB and pregnancy records um, of her, her pregnancies. Um, so this is important to have in place. A bit of information about our egg donors that I had mentioned, um, Circle Surrogacy has um, an egg donor database of approximately 200 women who are available for, for matching. Some of the highlighted requirements are um, that she be within 20 to 29 years of age, have a body mass index no higher than 30, have a healthy family history, no use of illegal drugs or cigarettes or any kind of alcohol abuse, and that she have a minimum of a high school degree. With regards to our surrogates, we have extremely high standards um, of women that we accept into our program. I, I would say Per month, we have on average about 800 applicants who apply online to become surrogates. And out of those 800 women, roughly 2% are approved. Um, we have a rigorous process of screening, which entails, as I mentioned, a, a woman going onto our website, filling out the online application. Um, there are about 10 preliminary questions that will either screen her in or out. Um, if she is screened in, she's invited to answer more questions, provide more information about herself. Should she move forward after that application is reviewed, women on our pre-screening team, um, four women on our pre-screening team review these materials. Um, two out of the four women on our pre-screening team are actually experienced surrogates themselves, um, and one of the women is also an egg donor as well. Um, so they know what to be looking for. Um, so once they move forward into the screening process with our social workers, um, we have a rigorous psychosocial evaluation that we do on these women um, and their support person, whoever that may be. Um, once they move forward out of the psychosocial screen, they move on to the psychological screen um, with our psychologist who administers what's called the MMPI exam. Um, once they pass this exam and they're deemed to move forward into matching with intended parents, um, that's when we contact you. 
Um, so the women who apply to Circle are women who want to help others. Uh, they're doing this because they want to help you grow a family, um, and hence why we encourage your communication with her throughout the journey. Um, some of the highlighted requirements of surrogates um, would be a body mass index of no higher than 30. She must be um, within 21 to 41 years of age and has to have given birth to a healthy child within the past seven years. As I mentioned, um, she goes through psychological screening. She also needs to be medically pre-approved by her IVF doctor. Um, she would live in a surrogate-friendly state in the U.S., again, something that Dean Hutchinson will talk to you about shortly. Um, she needs to have the support of family and friends, hence why we speak to her primary support person um, as well. And she must not use any illegal drugs, smoke cigarettes, or abuse alcohol. So we can move on to the legal piece here, and I'll hand this over to Dean Hutchinson, who will speak with you. Hi, good evening, everyone. My name is Dean Hutchinson. Uh, before I begin, I just want to let you know, those who have um, submitted questions so far, we're not ignoring you. Uh, at the end, when everyone is finished speaking, we'll answer those questions in, in turn. Um, <clears throat> we are, um, that way we can put the question to the person that, most will be most responsive to it. If you cannot wait till that till the end, uh, this is all going to be recorded. It's all going to be sent to you via email, so you'll have a full um, full presentation, and you can hear your question answered. Um, so, uh, again, my name is Dean Hutchison. I'm an attorney by trade. Um, I, I manage the legal department here at Circle. Um, I've been with Circle pretty much my entire ten-year legal career. Uh, my first job out of law school, I was a law clerk for John Weltman for both his private legal practice as well as circle surrogacy. Um, I, I did everything from uh, drafting agreements, um, uh, helping negotiate with egg donors, carriers, also doing all the legal work, pre-birth orders, adoptions, et cetera. Um, I then took a job as, a, as an attorney. John was a partner at a litigation firm in, in Boston um, while, started, while he was also running circle. Um, and although I was doing mostly general legal work, I was still assisting circle throughout that next six years I'm doing the same things, contracts and uh, adoptions, et cetera. Um, about four years ago, Circle uh, went off on its own um, separate space, and John started a separate law firm. Um, and within a year of them leaving uh, the old spot, I followed uh, into my position where I am now. Uh, my main focus in the legal department here is, is uh, the matching process um, that Alicia went over. I manage it from a legal end in that I'm making sure that the state where the carrier is from works legally with um, you know, not only surrogacy legally valid there, but also whatever your requirements are uh, for a birth certificate, whether you're a same-sex couple, single person, or a heterosexual couple, that all the legal work can be completed in that state. Um, I also then manage that legal work at the end. Um, if it's in a state where we're licensed to practice law, um, I do the legal work. Uh, if you're in one of the other many states in the country, um, I engage an attorney on your behalf, uh, introduce you to them, and monitor and manage that legal work throughout the process to make sure it's done. <coughs> um, so uh, first, just in general, um, I'll talk about surrogacy in the United States um, and it's how it's better than some of the other countries where surrogacy can be done from a, a U.S. perspective. Uh, so surrogacy has been, you know, there's a 20, 30 year legal history and probably has been practiced for 25 to 30 years. Um, so it's, number one, you're it's very hard pressed to find state court systems um, that have uh, never seen a surrogacy case, even cases that don't have statutory law or actually law written into the book about surrogacy. There's still uh, surrogacies going on, and judges are routinely granting court orders on parentage rights because there's other ways to get parentage rights, even if there isn't a statute in place. Um, from that same perspective, um, our social work team as well as our legal team works hand in hand with the hospital where the baby is being delivered. Um, just to set everything up in advance of the birth, um, as well as assist right after the birth with getting documents done, et cetera. Um, and you'll be hard pressed to find a, a hospital now in this country that hasn't had at least one surrogacy birth. Um, so that, that social stigma that may be um, in other countries is not here in the United States. Um, uh, also, working with an agency, we can um, kind of limit your trips to and from the clinic as well as the carrier state. You're most likely going to be looking at usually three to four trips outside of your home state. Um, there's usually at least one or potentially two trips to where your IVF clinic is located, um, one to do a screening, one to be there for a transfer. Um, and then there's usually two visits to the carrier's home state 
uh, minimum, and that is one usually around the week 16 to 20 ultrasound, um, which is a good time to go to um, not only see the ultrasound and find out the sex of the baby if you want to, um, but also will help you set up hospital tours and uh, meet doctors as well as get some familiarity with where you're going to be for the birth. Um, and then that final trip, of course, will be the birth. Um, uh, from a legal perspective, usually most of the legal work is done either immediately prior to the baby coming or immediately thereafter. Uh, so your stay after birth is really dictated upon, one, your child's stay in the hospital, whether it's a couple days or uh, weeks or so, um, as well as um, your own comfort level with traveling home, whether it's driving or flying back to where your home state is. Um, but we've had domestic clients who leave the day they're discharged from the hospital, maybe 48 hours after birth, and couples that stay one to two weeks just to um, get a comfort level and get a, a, a visit with the doctor before they take off. Um, uh, the U.S. is the only country that has um, a 23-year legal history um, in the field of surrogacy. Um, there's a famous decision in California uh, roughly 23 years ago um, that stood for the proposition that when you're using a gestational carrier um, and she has no genetic link to that child um, uh, and she signs an agreement prior to getting pregnant uh, indicating her intention not to have any rights to the child, that she has no rights to the child. Uh, most states have followed that California decision and even those that haven't technically followed that decision all have fallback provisions in their family court law system that say the judge must act in the best interest of the child when making a decision about custody or visitation, things like that. So you'd be uh, very hard to find a judge who's going to find in favor of a carrier. Um, where you used to see negative case law, and this trend is changing now as well, is um, in cases of traditional surrogacy, and that is when the carrier is also the donor, the egg donor. Uh, she obviously has a genetic link to the child. So there was a string of cases 10 to 15 years ago where uh, traditional surrogates were getting visitation rights because of this link. Um, where recently in August in the state of Wisconsin, um, there was just a decision that came down where a traditional surrogate attempted to get rights to a child, and the court said, no, it's in the best interest of that child that the carrier have no rights. Um, so the, the law is evolving in many states, but it's been evolving for the betterment. Um, although there are still some, um, because we're a system of 50 states with 50 different laws, you're not going to be able to work in every state um, depending upon your makeup and depending upon that state's laws. Currently, there's only six states and territories that prohibit surrogacy, um, and those are Washington State. Uh, it allows uncompensated surrogacy, but doesn't allow compensated surrogacy. Uh, the state of Michigan, the state of Nebraska, Washington, D.C. has an outright prohibition. New York State has an outright prohibition, and New Jersey just has currently bad case law. Uh, New York has a bill pending in its House and its Senate um, to allow surrogacy, which most likely will pass, so New York will switch. Um, and states like New Jersey and Louisiana actually passed good law within the last two years, but because of politics and play, the governors of those states um, vetoed those laws. So they may come back up, but currently we wouldn't work in those, those states. Um, uh, So just so you know, and Alicia went over our kind of social work screening team, our program coordination team, our social workers as well as independent social workers outside of here. Um, Circle also has a fully staffed legal team here in-house. Um, we have six licensed attorneys. Uh, John Weltman, who is our president, who Alicia said, who's been practicing law well over 30 years um, and had a niche in this area for the last 20. Scott Buckley, our current legal director and COO has been with Circle for the entire 10-year span I've been here. Um, uh, my history is 10 years directly with Circle. Uh, Gina Marie Mariano, who's in our legal department as a licensed attorney, has been with Circle since her first day of law school. She's also a four-time egg donor, so she has a, um, and she helps negotiate all the donor and carrier contracts. Um, Bruce Hale, who is more in our parent outreach staff, but is a licensed attorney in the state of Massachusetts, also assists with legal issues. Um, and we have a woman named Natalie Canellis, um, who assists with some insurance when insurance issues come into play. Um, she's an attorney that's been practicing well over 30 years. Um, we also are staffed with law clerks, um, usually one or two at a time. Um, so there is always someone available at Circle from a legal perspective if any issue arises during your journey. Um, we have a 24-7 hotline here for after-hours calls. If anything comes up, it is answered, uh, responded to, usually within the hour, no matter what time the call comes in. Uh, I can speak from experience in that 
usually questions arise at the birth with the legal work. Um, if a nurse on staff is kind of unfamiliar, if she doesn't check the record, um, and we're quick to respond to make sure all documents are there and things need to be faxed, et cetera. Um, plus, uh, you know, I shouldn't mention it, but we do give out our cell phones to all of our clients, um, uh, myself and most of the legal team will, so that if you need to get in touch with us immediately, um, someone from the legal team is, is there. Um, so <coughs> as kind of Alicia mentioned, I'll reiterate, um, we do offer full consultations. My talk right now is going to be very generic in that it's going to encompass all different types of um, situations, whereas um, these plans will be specifically tailored to you. So when you do come in for a full consultation, if you wish, uh, you'll have a more specific plan that I can put into place. But um, there's many different types of legal uh, processes that occur during a journey, um, not only the agreements that I'll talk about later, but the actual court work in order to establish your parental rights differs from state to state. Uh, there's some states with, with, that have what are called pre-birth orders, uh, and those are court orders coming about a month to two months prior to the birth, establishing your parental rights. Um, there's some states that allow the establishment of parental rights for two dads pre-birth, for couples using donors, for single parents, et cetera, or for even for couples that are using both donor egg and donor sperm, there are states that allow you to do this. Um, there's a handful of states that only allow type, these types of orders post-birth. It's just uh, kind of a draconian view of the law that they cannot make a court action until a live birth occurs. But in those cases, there's temporary legal work done um, prior to birth that establishes, you know, doesn't fully establish your rights, but gives you a certain guardianship and custodian rights so that you're making decisions at the hospital. Um, the hospital is fully on board and staff and knowing that um, court orders are coming immediately thereafter. So it's, you're treated much the same. It's just, uh, they, I'll give you an example. Vermont will not make a court order until a baby is born. Um, and then there's a couple states um, where it's termed an adoption. Um, not, it's not a full adoption like you would be if it was a non-genetic child, but it is termed an adoption. It's a post-birth adoption that uh, in states like Minnesota occurs usually within a week of birth. Um, and again, creates a birth certificate with both of you on it, and it's pretty simple. Um, uh, also, for our, our same-sex couples that are coming from states where you can do a second parent adoption at home, um, we usually advise to do that if your initial court order is not, is it just a pre-birth order or a parentage action so that you fully establish your rights in terms of all 50 states, because an adoption is a way um, uh, to uh, where all states give full faith and credit to that court decision so you can freely move throughout the country and that adoption is given full um, uh, protection. Um, uh, so when we're talking about the law and what, what law applies, uh, usually the most important law is the law of where the carrier is delivering, which is it's usually where she lives, although we sometimes have a carrier that lives five minutes from a border and the better hospital is on in a different state. So it's really where she delivers the child, because that's the state that's going to create the birth certificate and create your parentage rights. Um, as I said, there's a, about six places that we do not work in because of the laws of those states, um, uh, but that's going to be the state that applies. Um, again, if your state has great law, uh, I'll give you an example now that uh, California, if, if, a, if a resident of California, no matter where their carrier is, can actually get a parentage action in California prior to birth, um, and some states where the carriers will accept that court order um, so you can establish both parents' rights in your home state and then uh, bring that court order to where the carrier is. Um, from the other legal aspect, is there the agreements that are involved in a carrier or in a gestational surrogacy? Um, there's going to be usually three agreements, um, sometimes four. Um, so the first agreement is going to be an agreement for services with Circle. Um, this is the agreement that outlines the relationship between uh, us and you. Um, you have the right to, uh, we say, if, if we advise you if you want to go to an attorney to have an attorney negotiate on your behalf, but you're welcome to negotiate on your behalf as well. Um, our agreement isn't a contract of adhesion. You have the right to make changes or request changes to it, and we're open to it. Um, there's obviously an agreement between you and the carrier. Um, we're your attorney of record from the day you sign on with Circle, so we're going to be representing your um, behalf throughout the process. The carrier is going to have her own separate attorney throughout the process, so um, you don't have to worry about her not being protected. Um, if you need an egg donor, there's a separate agreement with the donor. Now, some IVF clinics in the past have said you don't need an agreement with the donor as long as the donor signs a waiver with the clinic, you're fine. We don't agree with that. Uh, there is some state law out there where donors um, have been hit with child support cases, things like that, so uh, we make sure you have an agreement uh, with the donor itself. 
Um, and then there's also usually an agreement um, for services with your IVF clinic that we can assist you in reviewing, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> so we have many different program options that are catered to you um, at Circle. Um, as Alicia mentioned, we have an unlimited IVF plan with Dr. Sahakian, who's going to speak after me, and that is you know, for one set cost, um, you get unlimited either single or multiple embryo transfers uh, until you have a live child. Um, uh, many clients have taken advantage of that because there's an added insurance obviously involved that you know if it takes two, three transfers, you're not paying per transfer. Um, we have obviously gestational surrogacy where you're using your own um, uh, embryos. We have uh, gestational surrogacy where you're using a donor, uh, GSED. Um, um, and then we have uh, clients who come in to us with their own donors. We can still assist you in finding you a carrot. Um, and then there's certain programs where um, you can Instead of finding a donor on your own, there may be donors in a bank somewhere and things like that. Um, we also here offer just straight egg donation services, so if all you need is a donor, um, Circle can provide those services as well. Um, again, once if you want to take the next step for a consultation, we'll cater uh, that consultation exactly to the program that we feel is best for you. Uh, <clears throat> so the cost, uh, very hard to speak to to a big group just because, again, it's very specific to your situation, um, and they vary program by program. Um, but in general, the costs associated with working with an agency like Circle are roughly 65000 to 100000 not including the insurance and medical expense piece of the, of the journey. Um, obviously, it's going to be more expensive if you need both donation and um, uh, carrier. Um, and a lot of those costs are really third-party costs that aren't directly going to Circle. There's going to be an agency fee to Circle. There's going to be a carrier's fee. There's going to be insurance expenses. There's going to be IVF costs. Um, but again, when we, uh, uh, you can go to our website that's listed here and see what the general costs are, cost estimate. Um, but when we have a full consultation, I can go over what, what you would be expecting. Um, uh, and then insurance. So another part of kind of the legal aspect of, of the surrogacy journey is the insurance perspective. Um, this will, again, be specific to you, um, but really when you're talking about insurance and surrogacy, it's two insurances mainly. It's insurance for the carrier and their pregnancy and delivery-related expenses, and it's insurance for the baby or babies to be born. Um, very simple for domestic clients. Any child born to the carrier, you'll, since it is your child and there's going to be a court order giving you parental rights, you can add that child to your insurance plan immediately upon birth. Um, it's usually within 30 to 60 days, depending on your plan, and it'll revert back to birth, so those costs are covered. Carriers insurance is a little different. Uh, we have carriers that have good maternity insurance already, and, and you can work with them. Um, more than likely, though, because of a, our insurance company's exclusion of surrogacy in their policies, um, you work with a carrier where you purchase a product for. Uh, most of our carriers that are uninsured are actually fully insured from a healthcare perspective. It's more of uh, they don't have coverage for surrogacy. Uh, so there's two companies, one called Universal Family Insurance, one called New Life Insurance, that offer this type of insurance. Um, and there's also currently, uh, and it will be again next year, but for the time being, uh, there are Obamacare plans that carriers can purchase in certain states um, that would cover surrogacy. Uh, those go away March 31st, but they're back again October 1st. Um, we also uh, require all of our um, intended parents to purchase life insurance for our carriers. Um, it's a surrogacy-based life insurance product. It's roughly $600. Um, and um, we help you put it in place. It just protects you and the carrier that if she was to pass away during a surrogacy. Um, we've had somewhat 800-some-odd uh, births in the last 18 years. This issue has never come up. Um, but we want it there to fully protect all the parties involved. Um, so again, as, as Alicia already mentioned, we do offer full consultation, so if you think you want to kind of take the next step and you're uh, close to a journey and want to find out more information about Circle, um, we offer free consultations. Uh, they're roughly two and a half hours. They'll speak to both a social work rep and a, an attorney. Um, you can come in-house if you want to do it. We travel in different places around the country um, and also internationally to do them, but we also can do them via Skype, um, which makes it very easy for our uh, clients all around the country to, to meet with us. Um, um, and that's, you know, you you can come into the, that meeting with your specific questions, and et cetera, and it's a very private one-on-one um, -on -one setting. 
Um, so if you want more information about Circle and you want to schedule a consultation, you can uh, go to our website, uh, which is listed above, circlesurrogacy.com, where you can reach out to Bruce Hale at uh, bhale at circlesurrogacy.com. Um, so thank you very much. I hope to um, hear from you in the future, and I'm sure I'll be back answering questions after uh, both Dr. Sahakian and um, uh, Brian has spoken. So um, I'll introduce Dr. Sahakian from Pacific Fertility. All right, just one this moment. This is Dr. Sakin. I'm presuming you can hear me. <laughs> can anybody hear me? I can yep. hear you. Oh, good. This is Brian. I'm, I've joined you guys. When you need me, I'm here. Okay, great. Okay. I'm waiting for my um, presentation to show, so I have control over it. Yeah, just one moment. And okay, you should be all set. Mm, I have control. Oh, perfect. Okay, so let me see how I can advance the slide. Mm, I can't advance the slide, Brian. You can. Uh, you should just just click or hit enter. There you go. Okay, perfect. I'm Dr. Sahakian. I'm the medical director of Pacific Fertility Center. I've been told to limit this presentation to 20 minutes, which I will do. It's hard for me to do so, but I'm going to try. I'm going to go through some of the slides pretty quickly, but I intend to give you a nice overview of the whole process and mostly stress the medical details. So uh, gestational service in egg donation is a relatively simple process even though it sounds complicated. That it's actually uh, scientifically speaking a very simple and a very successful process. There are certain steps every couple or individual has to go through which includes these six steps basically to pick an agency and a doctor then a donor then have everybody tested then go through the actual treatment of in vitro fertilization and finally have the pregnancy care and taking the babies home. Um, trying to go to the next slide here. I'm having a little hard time. Let's see. Okay. The, the first slide I want to go over, which is a very important one, is based on certain regulations in the United States that came about in 2005, instilled by the FDA. This is specifically related to anyone who will be using an egg donor or a gestational surrogate. And basically the FDA in 2005 came up and said everyone has to do a battery of tests if they are to use a gestational surrogate. And if you are in a high risk group, and they define high risk groups, homosexual men, people who live in Europe, anybody with a history of sexually transmitted diseases or hepatitis or a drug user. So all parties have to be tested who are going to use their gametes or their genetic sources to produce a baby using a surrogate. That means everybody who's giving sperm and everybody who's giving eggs has to be tested according to their regulation. The FDA regulations are very, very strict and there's strict penalties if the doctor doesn't follow it, but it's very easy to follow. Basically, uh, if you are a man who wants to use an egg donor and a surrogate to have a baby, you will need to be tested for these infectious diseases within seven days of producing your sperm sample that's going to be used to fertilize an egg that will turn into an embryo and transfer it into a surrogate. So you have two options. One is to be present at the time of the egg retrieval or shortly before that to have the blood test done and produce a fresh semen sample and be tested at the time, or to freeze a sperm sample anytime you want and be tested at the time you produce the sample to be frozen. Well, over the last 10 years, we have done now thousands of cases, and we realize that the success rates with frozen and fresh sperm is exactly the same. In very few instances, 
we need to use fresh sperm. Only if the sperm is really bad or sperm specifically doesn't freeze and thaw well. 99.9% .9 of cases, frozen sperm yields similar results to fresh sperm. This actually has made things very easy now because you don't have to be present at the clinic where you're doing the IVF cycle. More than 60% of my patients don't live in LA and theoretically these men don't have to come to LA. Now they choose to come and be tested here but we can have them go either to New York if you are at the East Coast or from Europe or come to Los Angeles to basically give a sperm sample which we will freeze and test you at the same time. So we really need you in Los Angeles where my clinic is for one day where you would produce a sample and we would freeze it. And we would use that sample to fertilize the eggs at the right time in the future. All right, so let's go to the next slide. <clears throat> Things are moving a little slower. So I'm going to go pretty fast through these slides. Obviously, I said your first step is to choose a surrogate agency. And you've got to look at the experience and the cost and the accessibility of the agency. Uh, you know, that's something you guys need to do. Uh, your due diligence when you look for an agency. The important thing I need to stress quickly here is that when you you choose an agency, the, sur the agency does a lot of the background work to pick a surrogate for you. They go through the medical records of every woman who applies. They reject 99% of women who apply. And the ones who pass have to pass a rigorous um, medical screening, which includes a past history, their records are reviewed and it's only after all those tests, all those reviews of records and the social uh, reviews of her situation, etc., is that is when they present you with a surrogate uh, as a match. So it's a very rigorous process. Uh, these couple of slides I'm showing, showing basically all the questions that are asked to a surrogate or when we review the records we make sure that the surrogate doesn't have these diseases before we uh, recommend them to you. Uh, after you have your agency, you're going to choose an IVF clinic. Again, you've got to look at the experience of the clinic, their success rates, and obviously the financial incentives or the package deals. And every patient going or every intended parent going through this process need to speak to two, three clinics and then compare and decide on their own which clinic is best. I have been doing this for over 20 years. Uh, we will talk about success rates in a little bit. Uh, and because of our success rates, we have very uh, lucrative incentives, financial plans which help you limit the, the basically the cost of the doctor. Um, this step is an important one and I want to dwell on it for a few minutes. You really can't choose a surrogate. You are presented with a surrogate from the agency and you can say yes or no if you like the surrogate. But a good agency will typically present you with a surrogate that's a perfect match for you and you don't have to worry about anything more than that. As far as the donor, however, you have obviously a lot of input. You basically are picking your genetic um, child. You know, half of your child is going to be genetically linked to this egg donor, so you need to be picky. You need to make sure to pick a woman that fits your uh, desire. So there are certain things we need to talk, to, talk about when you um, uh, looking at an egg donor. First, when do you start looking for a donor? Well, I typically recommend you start looking for an, uh, an egg donor one to two months prior to an invent, impending surrogate match. It could take a day to find a donor, but sometimes if you're picky, it could take you a month or two. You basically look at online databases. I always recommend you start looking at the database of the uh, agency you're working with. So Circle has a big donor database, you can start looking there, but if you don't find someone you like there, they will really refer you to other sister agencies. So you have at your uh, disposal hundreds and hundreds of donors to pick you from. Uh, an egg donor typically is a young woman, a healthy woman who might have had a child or might not, and is someone who's doing it obviously to help someone and also to get compensated during the process. What you're looking for when you're looking, uh, you're uh, trying to find a donor is very, very important. Number one criteria that is clearly associated with success rate is the age of the donor. I recommend to stick to donors who are under 30. I personally prefer a donor who's under 26 simply because the pregnancy rates are higher if you have a 22-year-old donor versus a 
you know, 28 year old donor. I typically recommend to my patients to stick to donors who are under 26 years old. However, if you want to pick a donor who's 26 to 29, I would prefer if you pick a donor who's, who's donated before successfully, and that's what we call a proven donor. I failed to mention that there are two types of donor. There is the anonymous donor and there's the open donor. Uh, anonymous donor obviously means you never meet the donor, and an open donor is someone who is willing to meet you. We recommend that you meet the donor uh, to create a bond and also to know more about the person you're going to use the genetic material of. Um, so I discussed about the proven versus first-time donor. I don't mind first-time donors. I always say every donor has been a first-time donor. And I would say if you're going to use a first-time donor, you can def definitely pick a woman who's under 26. You can certainly look at different physical characteristics when you uh, pick a donor. Height and weight is definitely genetic. You can look at the medical history that these women fill. Uh, the location of where the donor resides is irrelevant. Donors will travel to the IVF clinic for about three to five days during the treatment cycle. So don't make that as a prerequisite. Uh, compensation of donors vary from eight to fifteen thousand dollars. Some agencies uh, try to uh, find donors who are uh, repeat donors or you know Ivy League donors, and they charge twenty, thirty thousand dollars. I think, in my in my opinion, that's ridiculous. I think you can find a perfectly suitable donor who is compensated around eight to ten thousand dollars. Every donor goes through physical exam and testing, including some genetic risk assessment by a geneticist before we can fully accept it into the program. Once you have picked the donor and you have a surrogate match, now you're into the testing phase. Uh, every party has to be tested, namely the sperm source, the egg source, and the surrogate. Um, or I, I typically recommend that all parties, if I was the doctor, to come to my clinic at the same time. Basically, the intended parents could come and meet the surrogate and the donor during the testing phase. During this visit, the intended parents will give a sperm sample, which we will freeze. They'll undergo the FDA testing, including some genetic testing, and we also check your blood type. The donor undergoes a detailed medical history, undergoes a physical exam, and all the blood tests required by the FDA, in addition to an ultrasound exam to check her ovaries. And the surrogate, in her turn, goes through a rigorous exam to make sure that she is good enough to uh, be a gestational carrier. Now, you could find a surrogate, be matched with a surrogate, find a donor, and everything is a go until this step. There is a 1% chance that we will basically reject a donor or a surrogate after we get the results of their test. It's very rare, but it does happen, and therefore I always like to mention that uh, be aware that just because you picked a donor and just because you were matched with a surrogate, doesn't mean 100% that those women will actually undergo the treatment. And if they fail, then you, have, you are back to square one as far as that person, and you've got to look for a new donor or a new surrogate if they fail the medical screening. We do not screen donors and surrogates before the match because it's just too expensive. We have to wait till someone actually picks the donor or someone is actually matched with the surrogate. Once the testing phase is done, which takes about two weeks, we will proceed with the IVF treatment. IVF, which stands for in vitro, fertility, uh, in vitro fertilization, is actually a very simple but high-tech process. What I want to show you in the next few slides is uh, important concepts that will help you understand how IVF is done. So when you're doing in vitro fertilization cycle, the whole purpose is to get eggs, fertilize the eggs in a laboratory setting, create embryos, and transfer the embryos back to the uterus. Well, the stimulation of the ovaries to produce eggs is based on some normal physiology that's very important for, for you to understand. I'm hoping you can see my pointer, but a, a, a female ovary is, contains all the eggs from birth. Unlike men, where we make sperm every 72 days pretty much until we die, a woman is born with a set number of eggs, and she uses up those eggs over time. The reason why a young woman gives you better eggs and more eggs is because she's born with a set number of eggs, and as she gets older, first of all, she's using up those eggs, so an older woman will produce less eggs. Second, an egg that's been sitting there 
gets old, gets rotten, gets genetically broken with time. Even though that doesn't happen till you're in your mid-30s or late-30s, it starts happening right after birth. So a 22-year-old donor will have younger, fresher eggs than a 32-year-old donor. And what, hap what happens during a natural cycle, a cohort of eggs, bunch of eggs, will start growing, typically uh, dozens and dozens of eggs. And one of those eggs will become mature and will ovulate. During the process of this one egg growing, chemicals will be secreted that will basically kill every other egg in the batch, and only one will mature. Well, we take advantage of this process by giving the woman fertility hormones, which are the same hormones her body produces in larger quantities, and basically salvage or rescue some of those eggs that otherwise she would have lost. And a typical young woman, we, would be, we could salvage as many as 30 to 40 eggs average being around 20 to 25 eggs, which is what you should expect from an egg donor. And then what happens uh, during uh, the natural process, the egg is released into the tube. The sperm actually comes through the uterus, through the tubes, and fertilizes the egg inside the tube. And here's another concept that's important for you to understand, which will make sense in a second, is after fertilization, when you have an embryo, the embryo takes about three to four days to reach the uterus, and it's on day five or six when the embryo implants actually lodges itself inside the lining of the uterus. Why is this important? Well, because we do embryo transfers on day five, five days after we retrieve the eggs, which is basically analogous with ovulation. And that's where the five days came from. That's the best time where the lining of the uterus will accept the embryo, and, and it's physiologically the most suitable period. Now, we can easily do an ultrasound on a donor, and we can count these little follicles that contain eggs. And when I said a donor comes in for screening, this is exactly what she undergoes, an ultrasound where we can look at her ovaries, count the eggs, and decide if she's a good donor or not. And if the, I gave this donor fertility hormones, which is what happens during an IVF treatment, she takes these injections, which are, uh, again, hormones produced, the same hormones produced by her brain, except in larger quantities. We can actually monitor her with vaginal ultrasound. We can see the ovaries, and we can basically follow the growth of these little follicles, which in this slide you can see they're bigger. Each one of these follicles has an egg. So a woman who produces 25 eggs will have 25 of these follicles that when mature, which happens usually 10 to 12 days after taking the hormones, we can actually go in and retrieve them, a procedure called egg retrieval. Go in with a needle into the ovaries and suck these follicles which contain the eggs. And the eggs go then in a little tube which we can fish out in the laboratory and this is how an egg will look like. And then that same day we will throw a sperm sample and if there's the intended parents are two individuals, we would divide the eggs in half. We would throw one sample from each partner, and then each egg is injected with a single sperm, which is called an intracytoplasmic sperm injection. This will assure that at least 70% of the eggs would be fertilized. Once the eggs are fertilized, you get what we call an embryo. Uh, initially, the embryo has two cells. This embryo will continue dividing from two to four to eight cells, and by day five, the embryo will be called a blastocyst. This is an embryo where you can't count the cells anymore, but it's the most competent embryo that will give you the best chance of a pregnancy. Now, um, this is another slide showing you an embryo that's been growing, and after the blastocyst, every embryo will hatch before implantation, exactly like a chick do, a chick will do outside an egg. And you can see this is the shell and embryo is hatching just before implantation. Um, as far as the surrogate is concerned, we check her uterus, we check her lining, and we can actually measure the lining, and we know uh, how a good lining looks. And once the embryos are ready, which is typically five days after the egg retrieval, the surrogate will come in. We will uh, take a little catheter, this catheter right here, we will load the catheter with one or two embryos in a bubble, and I will introduce this catheter inside the uterus. It's a two-minute, very, very important and critical process, but it's a very quick process, a painless procedure, 
whereby the embryos are deposited into the uterus. I forgot to mention that the egg retrieval is done under anesthesia for the egg donor. It takes 10 to 15 minutes. They don't feel any pain. They stay with us for an hour and they go. So once the embryo transfer is completed, the surrogate stays with us for about an hour or two. They, then she goes home and rests for a day or two, uh, and then she can resume normal activities. Typically, we will do a blood pregnancy test 10 days after the transfer, and if she's pregnant, we will recommend an ultrasound examination two weeks later to see if the pregnancy is progressing well. We typically recommend another ultrasound you know, eight, at 8 and 10 weeks of gestation to assure the normal growth of the baby. Once we reach that point, the surrogate is discharged to her obstetrician for her OB care. Um, at the end, this is the, some pictures for you. This is how a pregnancy looks at five weeks. This is a six weeks pregnancy. This is actually the baby. This is the first time we can see a heartbeat. That's why we recommend doing an ultrasound, the first ultrasound at six weeks, so we can document viability. This is an eight weeks baby. This is a 10 week baby where you can already, this looks like a gummy bear, but here it looks like a little teddy bear. You can see the head and the body, two little arms. It's a kind of a cute thing to look at. And if you have twins, uh, which has a high rate, we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, twins will look like this. These are two babies in two different sacks. And obviously, at one point, they're born and they're really nice and cute until they're about this age when, uh, you know, you count your blessings. So let's talk about um, uh, this one I can skip. Basically, the surrogate uh, will go and follow her OB care with her own doctor. It's important, important that the intended parent stays involved and stays in common communication with the doctor who's going to deliver your baby. Um, these are common questions I want to make sure I answer. Um, is there a difference between using fresh and frozen sperm? The answer is no. Uh, is there a difference between fresh and frozen embryos? The answer is yes. When you do an IVF cycle, the first cycle is always obviously fresh, but any leftover embryos are frozen. And if you get a pregnancy and you have a baby, you can come back at a later date to have another baby using a frozen embryo. Or if the first cycle fails, but you still have frozen embryos, you don't have to go and do another cycle with an egg donor. You can just throw some of those embryos and uh, transfer them and still have a pretty good chance of, uh, of a pregnancy. We'll talk about the success rates in a second. The typical treatment will last about four to five weeks. Expect to obtain 20 to 25 eggs. We would divide the eggs in any ratio that the intended parents want. Uh, we can do 50-50, 30-70, whatever you wish. We typically transfer one or two embryos, no more than two embryos. And we can do genetic testing or determine the sex if the couple wants to. The only drawback to this is that the process of biopsying the embryo to check for its genetics can weaken the embryo and thus lower the pregnancy. What are the success rates with this process? Um, let's go to the next slide. Uh, it depends on how many embryos you transfer, and obviously it depends uh, where you go to do this treatment. Uh, in my program, if you transfer two embryos, almost 80% chance you're going to get pregnant and have a baby. If you transfer one, you have a 67%, and if you do frozen cycle, pregnancy rates drop to about 60 um, one thing you need to note is that if you transfer two fresh embryos, expect a 60% chance you're going to end up with twins. That's pretty much my part, and I will uh, stay for a few minutes to answer questions. Brian, you can take over. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Dr. Sahakian. Um, before we move on to Brian to share his, his own experience, I did see a couple questions that are medical in nature. I know you have to... I have to uh, leave, yes, yeah, so I would like to take those so, if possible. Yeah, the first one is, do you only use ICSI or do you do DISH IVF as well, and are there any benefits or risks ICSI carries over a DISH IVF? Very good question. Now, um, ICSI is the process of injecting the sperm into, it, into the egg. DISH IVF is basically the conventional method where we put sper sperm around the egg, incubate it overnight, and let the sperm do the job. Uh, when we're using frozen sperm, we prefer to do ICSI because we get higher pregnancy rates, better fertilization rate, and better quality embryos. But if someone does not want it, we don't have to. I prefer to do it. Now, 
there is data linking ICSI with higher anomalies, but that data is skewed, doesn't apply to this type of a population where there's no infertility that, and there's no male factor infertility. The whole process of in vitro fertilization, even dish fertilization, is associated with a slightly higher chance of congenital anomaly, but uh, ICSI itself is only if you're using poor quality sperm, which means there's already a problem with the sperm. Otherwise, we've done now thousands and thousands of cycles in our program. Uh, I've done over six to 7,000 IVF cycles with ICSI, and the anomalies are no more than the general population. Any other questions, Brian? Uh, yes, we've got, is there a difference using frozen egg or fresh egg? Another very good question. Again, it's the time is so limited that I could not dwell on every uh, topic. But yes, there's a huge difference between frozen eggs and fresh eggs. And I don't recommend the use of frozen eggs because success rates are lower. Um, even though in the, re in, re in the recent years our pregnancy rates are much higher with frozen eggs, I don't see why anyone would prefer to use frozen eggs except to save cost, to save money, in which case you're taking a major a hit with pregnancy rate. So I would prefer fresh embryos rather than using frozen eggs to save money and actually end up probably costing you more because success rates would be lower and you'll have to do it again and again. Okay, and we'll take one more medical question. Um, this The question is, what is the success rate of a sperm donor, I'm, I'm guessing they mean sperm contributor, in their 40s? Pregnancy rates with, uh, uh, are linked with the egg donor's age and not so much with the sperm source's age, except that recently there has been some data showing that actually sperm does deteriorate as the man gets older, but really you don't have, you don't have anything to worry about until you're in your late 50s. The one thing we do worry about, uh, on the other hand, is that the risk of schizophrenia and autism does increase with men's age. Typically, a slight increase after the age of 39, but a major increase in your 60s. Um, I don't know. I will take w one last one. It says, what if we want to use my egg and I am 33 years of age? Is there a risk? No. 33 years certainly is a very good age to still use your eggs if you need a surrogate. Uh, certainly, your pregnancy rates are not going to be the same as a 22-year-old donor, but 33 is not old. I would certainly want you to be tested, make sure that your ovarian reserve is good, but if it, it is, you should still expect very high pregnancy rate at 33. Okay, great. Thank you. I can you take a so couple much. of more if there's any more questions. There actually, there aren't any more uh, okay. um, nature right now, but if any, if um, people... I'm going to have to leave then. I wish you guys all the best, and if you have any questions, um, Maybe, Brian, at the end you can give them my email address and I'll be happy to answer anyone with an, e uh, with an email. Of course. Yep, we'll pass those along. Um, thanks Thank again, you. and we're going to move on to Brian. Uh, Brian, are you there? I'm here. Can everybody hear me? Yeah, everyone can hear you, so um, go ahead and take over. Hi, everybody. Um, I don't know how many people I'm speaking with, but I can tell you that hearing all of this uh, brings back some very actually good memories. Um, so much of what you've been hearing about and so much at the beginning of this process is really a science project and it's weird and it's new, at least it was to um, my husband Matt and me. So we didn't approach IVF or fertility with any sort of um, fear or frustration. We came at it with pure hope and I think it, that's an important thing to note about us. Um, two guys trying to have a family, and we found Circle through uh, a couple of ways. It was circuitous. They kept coming into our lives every time we looked or thought about the process, and so it was a natural fit. And when we met uh, John and, uh, and the crew over at Circle, we just knew it was going to be right. Also, uh, we happened to live in New York City, and they're in Boston, and and I didn't know how great that would be for us, even though they could be anywhere. For many of you might be around the world, for all I know. Um, the proximity was nice because in the long run, our surrogate happened to be 
uh, in the Boston area as well. And that was pure irony um, because there's great surrogates all over the country and they have access to them. So I, one thing that Dr. S I think it was Sahagian said, um, if I pronounced your name wrong, I'm sorry. Um, but one thing he said that rang true for me was really trust the databases that your surrogacy agency has because they have really, they've been through this for years and they know what's good and they know what's not good and they know what they know the lay of the land let them be your GPS and trust them it's important the thing that I want to stress now is just how much of this is a human story and right now while I had you guys on my microphone on mute I was getting the girls ready for bed we have two girls um, Pearl and Daisy and one is the Pearl is two and Daisy is 10 months old and we were fortunate enough to be able to use the same egg donor and the same surrogate for both girls. And one of the things that attracted us to our, our egg donor was the fact that she was willing to meet us. And it, in her profile it said she wasn't willing to meet us. So um, we asked if she would reconsider and with some thoughts she did. And I thought that was important. For us, that was important. For some, it's not important, and some would rather not know. But I, it was part of a, it was a priority for us. So we were able to meet our egg donor, and I can tell you she's lovely in every way, and, and we like and admire and respect her immensely. And it was important for me, and that was important. And some of the surrogacy agencies that we had met, um, uh, somewhere out west and we made the trip and interviewed them and some of them didn't see that as a priority and actually discouraged it uh, and Circle said hey if the donor is willing to meet you and you're willing to meet her and it will uh, you know that relationship can be built and that's something you want then uh, by all means go for it and so I liked that I really did it for me the more human this experience was that I, I trust the science I trust the experts that Circle encouraged us to use or put in our way and and uh, I'm glad we did it served us very well because the trust takes away the stress and uh, the human story can begin the surrogate we met was also on a short list that they had of surrogates that might appeal to us we went through and uh, Matt and I both had chosen the same ones we kind of went through a short list together and we checked off the ones that we liked or at least appealed to us online and when then we compared lists and we had a couple of overlaps and the two ultimately that we used the egg donor and the surrogate were both on that list and so we put a little shout out to by way of circle to our surrogate who ironically lived in the state of Massachusetts and and when we went and had uh, Memorial Day weekend picnic with her and her family because she happened to have had children of her own and that I found very interesting because for me again the human story is more important than the science. I trust the science. Um, I wanted to find out why she was doing it. And so I asked, and she, she had reasons, and they weren't economic. And it, it was actually, I find that the more I meet these the surrogates and, frankly, the egg donors, um, there is a gene, I guess, and I'm, I'm not being scientific here, but there's something in them that they have, and some of it is really there's some wonderful reasons that they approach surrogacy or egg donorship and I found that amazing because I don't have that gene I don't think I could do it and thank God for these people that do and um, my daughter Pearl just came in and escaped her crib hi Pearl uh, so uh, I'm rambling a bit I hope that's okay I think circuitously anyhow but at the end of the day all of this comes together Build the relationship with Circle and trust the people that they put in front of you. And I promise you that all of these worries about the uh, how many blastocysts and how many, you know, it all, it all just comes together. And we had a false start at one point. The first egg donor we chose um, did not ultimately respond favorably to the stimulation drugs that they gave her so she, when we went when it was time for them to to go and retrieve there weren't it was an impressive number at all it was actually quite disappointing but the way that circle handled that because they've been down every block that you can imagine 
uh, was with dignity and, and with great care. And it really was disappointing for us, but we trusted them, and we still do immensely. And I feel like they're family. Um, in point of fact, we actually went to Massachusetts, and we got married because at the time it was illegal in New York. And so we went to, to Mass because they were giving us everything, the ability to marry, the ability to have this family that we've dreamed so, so long for. And uh, when we went to get married, we went that day to do our wills with, with Circle 2. We, we employed them to do that because that was part of it. And uh, they threw us a, an impromptu reception because we had just been to the, to the Justice of the Peace in, um, in Boston. And uh, they weren't going to let it just be a technicality. They gave us a beautiful wedding like reception that we didn't even expect. And that was great. The cake was from a place the Kennedys apparently get their cakes. It was great. And they just went the extra mile for us every step of the way. We met our next ag donor who was fantastic. And uh, right after the, the failed attempt, and we rebooted and we went forward. So this it wasn't always storybook, but I think we were emotionally trusting. And we gave them, we let them be the professionals they are because they will guide you. And it's, it's, it's hard not to want to micromanage every single bit of this. But I promise you, in the end, it will, it will be a beautiful thing. And all of that scientific worry and all those little notebooks you put together and all those files on your computer, they've just become a memory. And uh, the journey was so nice the first time we did it again with the same players, 16 months later after Pearl was born, and I, it was fantastic. And uh, just be, su be willing to be surprised and, and build relationships that you didn't think were possible. And, and I really think of Circle as our family, too. I really do. And um, I just I wish you all the very, very best with all of it. And if anyone ever wants to reach out to me and just ask questions, I'm not a scientist. Um, in point of fact, I'm a real estate agent, <laughs> and uh, but I can tell you a lot about the human journey, and I think that's ultimately what this is. Weighted heavily in science at the beginning, and certainly weighted very heavily in in, in relationships, and I think that's important. And you've got you've got good people all around there. I can attest to it, and I hope that's helpful for you. Yeah, that was great, Brian. Um, I don't know if you mind just hanging around for a few minutes in case we get any questions that are specifically directed at you. Sure. Um, great. We're just going to go through some of the questions that have been asked so far. Um, now's a good time if you have a lingering question to type that into that questions pane, um, and we'll, we'll try to get to all of them. Um, the first one is, do we have a PDF with the PowerPoint? Yes. We'll, we'll send that along after the webinar has ended and, and also a video recording. So again, if you missed anything or you, or you want to go back and watch this again or just review the slides, we're happy to pass those along. Okay. Um, first question is, is the process of surrogacy easier or cheaper if same-sex couples are married? Um, it, it can't, I say it's a little easier because it may open up states you can work in in the sense of getting parental right legal work for both dads. Uh, I'll give you an example or both moms. Uh, Massachusetts is one state that requires a marriage for our pre-birth order um, um, legal work here. So if you're not married, you have to wait and do an adoption. It's not going to really change costs in the process. It's just going to make, usually all it's going to change is make the legal work at the end uh, usually easier. Um, what does the color on the map? The question is, what does the color on the map represent? I don't think it. Let me let me go back. You can go back. So I don't think it has any bearing. Um, yeah, I think it's just a generic map. Um, uh, it has no bearing on, on surrogacy laws or things like that. Um, so I wouldn't worry about anything with that. Um, okay, the question, if we live in New York and we use donor egg and donor sperm, other than Connecticut, what other states are available? How long will be the wait? Um, so it used to be a, a six states. It's actually somewhat increased. More and more states are allowing this. So uh, right now, Connecticut 
um, uh, the Connecticut parts of Maine, Arkansas, um, many counties in Pennsylvania, Texas allows it. Um, little off the head, but it's roughly about 10 places, California, um, Minnesota, or another two that you can still work in. It may increase your wait time four to six weeks or so on top of it, but it's really a lot of the states where we get um, carriers are the states that I just mentioned. So it hasn't, I mean, I think Alicia, from a matching perspective, we haven't really seen much of an increase for couples using um, both sperm and egg donors. No. Do we offer an option for having the carrier carry two embryos at the same time? If so, is the cost the same as carrying one embryo? So yes, we'll, um, the carrier can, you can use work with a carrier who carries multiple embryos. The cost of the program itself are the same, where costs may increase are uh, with a twin pregnancy, there tend to be some overage that can occur. Uh, there's conditional costs. Um, you know, carrier may have a multiple carrying fee where she gets extra money if she gets pregnant with twins. Um, Usually more likely a carrier would be put on bed rest, so there may be some costs associated with paying her lost wages. Um, also, C-sections are more likely with um, twins, so just added costs associated with the twin pregnancy, not with the program itself. Um, does Dr. Sahakian have a clinic in New York? Um, how would we establish parental rights in Michigan since it's prohibited? So, uh, Dr. Sahakian has a affiliate lab in New York. Um, so if you're only providing sperm and just need to get blood tests as well as um, donate, uh, leave the sperm sample, he has a lab there that you can um, meet with, leave the blood test as well as the sperm sample. The sperm gets shipped to uh, his lab. Um, but if you need, to, if you're doing both sperm and egg retrievals, you'd have to go to his LA office. Um, as, as far as establishing the parental rights in Michigan, um, the carrier won't be from Michigan, so it won't matter. Um, we'd match you if it's a same-sex couple who's worried about a, a second parent adoption. We just match you in a state where we know we can establish both your parental rights, either through a pre-birth, post-birth order, or through an adoption in that state for the carrier. Um, what does 100% success rate mean for your agency? What it means is that couples that um, say listen to our guidance and stick with the program, um, we have 100% success rate of them having children. Um, not everyone is successful, and now what I mean by that is we have couples, uh, example, heterosexual couples that only want to have children using their embryos, their sperm and egg, and will never switch to a donor no matter what their age is, so they attempt you know, three or four transfers. If they're not successful, they leave the program. But couples that are willing to switch to donation or listen to our, um, or stick with the program, uh, it's a 100% success rate. Uh, our circle's agency fee itself uh, is no different whether it takes you one carrier and one transfer or it takes you six transfers and three carriers. We're not going to keep adding a new agency fee. You're going to pay the same price no matter how long it takes for you to get pregnant. Uh, we are a same-sex female couple in Maryland. Oh, okay, that was a mistake. Um, if my husband and I create embryos in the state of Pennsylvania, where would the transfer take place, our home state or carrier's home state? So wherever your clinic is, so if you uh, I want to work with a clinic in Pennsylvania, the carrier would come to your um, established clinic. Um, we would coordinate with that clinic, and the transfer would occur in um, where the, uh, the eggs are. If you, however, have uh, embryos already created and you want to work with another clinic, those frozen embryos can be shipped to um, clinics all around the country. Is Asian egg donation rare? Is it more expensive to use than Asian egg donation? I, I don't think it's more expensive in that the uh, assisted reproductive medicine guidelines in this country um, really don't allow agencies and or clinics to work with donors that charge more than the $10,000. Um, there are specific Asian egg donation companies. Um, I believe we have a small set of uh, donors within our um, Circle database, as well as more when you look at our expansive, uh, our sister agencies. So we have relationships with four national agencies that have more, um, more available Asian donors, but there's also Asian-specific donation sites. Okay, so those are all the, oh, we got one more question. Okay, so 
uh, the circle recommend any sperm donors regard the specific ethnicity to match our needs? And also, is there a clinic in Mass where IVF procedures can be performed? There's a bunch of IVF clinics in Massachusetts. There's Boston IVF, Mass General Hospital. Uh, there's a website with SART.org where you can review clinics all over the country. Um, we wouldn't say you know, the sperm donation question is going to be more uh, geared towards the sperm donation company, but I don't think we recommend any ethnicity over another. Um, how likely is it that we get a surrogate in Mass? If you specifically want to wait for a surrogate in Massachusetts, you'll wait a long time because it's a very specific need. Um, but there are many states that um, will cater to your needs anyway outside of Massachusetts. So, um, you know, it's possible, but you'd be limiting yourself to one state amongst 42 where surrogacy is really practiced. Okay, does anyone have any specific questions for Brian while we have him um, to get the experience of a to hear from an experienced parent? We'll hang on the line for a few more minutes and just wait to see if any more questions come in. But as of right now, there there aren't any. So. Um, so the question was uh, next question was how long is the wait time for a surrogate? Um, so it depends on a couple things, but in our for our domestic clients, um, roughly two to four months, um, and you know depending on your specific needs, it might be closer to four months. If it's you have a very simple match, closer to the two month time. Um, when is the right time to set up a consultation? Um, I would say if, if you're within probably you think you're about a, a year, maybe a year and a half out from starting a surrogacy journey is a good time. Um, you know, we can do pre-consultations as well. We can get a little more information directly with Bruce. That contact information we have put up, Hale at Circle Surrogacy, you can respond directly to him and set up an initial meeting with him, and he can kind of decide whether he thinks you're ready for full. But it's usually if you're within a year, 18 months of starting a journey. What is the likelihood of having twins? More of an IVF question, but national average for GSED, when you Implant multiple embryos, roughly a 70% chance of getting pregnant on the first transfer, and roughly a 40% chance of twins on every time you're implanting uh, multiple embryos. Um, this one's for Brian. Uh, Brian, uh, what was one negative aspect of the process? I think, uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah. I think that the the negative aspect for me had to do with my, it was a personal thing. At first, I, I, I like to micromanage, I like to control. And Matt really had to uh, advise me and, and say, you know, back off. Because I was trying to control things that were out of my reach and out of my realm of expertise, frankly, as much as I tried to read and, and get up. So it was very frustrating for me to really let go at certain points and trust, you know, because there's a lot of hope tied up in it and there's a lot of passion and there's a lot of, you know, it's the first time we'd been around the block was with, with Pearl, the journey to Pearl. And that was more of a personal journey to, to trust and let go. I just, I like to, I, 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 I control all day long and that's, that was my thing. I think another frustrating point was when we heard that our first egg donor's retrieval um, was unsuccessful. We, we, there was no reason that our first egg donor, the, the, the first uh, young lady that we chose, that on the books, in the science, when you looked at all the tests, there was just no way that she wasn't going to be a rock star donor. And, and she was a rock star person. I loved her. She was a sweetheart. Um, but it didn't work out, and there was really no indication that would have anyone would have ever known and it's incredibly rare so don't let that frustrate you but that was a frustrating moment as you can imagine we had our surrogate teed up ready to receive we had the egg donor ready to donate we were ready to go with our fresh you know the science bit was ready to happen and uh, and then we just the most important one of the most important ingredients wasn't available to us after a journey of that and I'm, I'm sure it was equally frustrating for the donor the surrogate circle us but 
this is a rare thing. And again, I think that people are defined by how they react in times of trial. And I was super impressed with Circle. It was a Sunday night when it was all sort of happening. Sunday is the day you know what's good. For whatever reason, I remember being a Sunday. And we got a call. and. and the world in. I just had never been there. I was I was in uncharted waters, and so they were truly. And I don't want to mean to sound Pollyanna about it. Uh, if they hadn't handled it well, we probably would not have come back to them. Put it that way. And it led us to our next egg donor. And again, letting go and trusting, letting the professionals do their work. They've been down pikes before that we didn't even think were imaginable. And most of these are much less uneventful, but everyone's journey will have an angled, uh, an interesting uh, turn, I'm sure of it. Maybe not as dramatic as ours, and hopefully not. But the way they handled it was, it gave me great ease. And I did learn a lot about myself during the journey. And thank God it takes nine months for a baby after you conceive, because you need that time uh, to to prepare and to mentally get ready and, and do whatever mental and spiritual homework you need to do to prepare because that's the most important thing when the baby's in your arms and uh, it just it really just all melts away and it turns into this this amazing love affair and I hope you all get the chance to experience that um, I will say one last thing about why we chose circle if you haven't sat with John Weldman or you haven't spent time with him again being a sort of a controlling guy I felt the need to make sure that we were legally, legally protected. We were an unorthodox couple. Uh, now it's becoming more orthodox. But to me, I, I just wanted to make sure my legal vulnerabilities were all shored up as much as we could because I didn't want to have uh, some politician on a whim be able to take away my life and my family. I was, I was coming from a place of fear, and I wanted to protect. The beauty of... Um, and this is before DOMA was struck down and, and all that, and that was only a couple of years ago. So I was impressed with John's legal background. And if I'm wrong, correct me, guys, but I think he has passed the bar in every state where he um, does business like this, when he, when he makes these families happen in different states and countries. And he, he's an expert, and he is the father of two children. I think they're now in college, at least one of them is, and... and he did that through surrogacy when no one was doing that, certainly not two men. So he was on the cutting edge and the legal edge, and it is because of his hard work that we are able to do what we're doing today, at least as men, two men. And I know many of you are not in a situation like that, but that impressed me. He had lived it. He had done it. He had helped create laws. He had the legal expertise to give us the protection that we needed. And Again, being controlling, that gave me a great sense of relief. Plus, I think he's a stand-up guy and quite a character, and I like being around him. And he's never led me wrong. He's never led me astray, and his team is awesome. Highly recommend it. And if we had, if we weren't, uh, if we were younger and uh, had, a, had a little more money, I think we'd, we'd keep going and do it again. But really, I really miss, uh, I miss many of the milestones because it's so sweet and we're super okay, close to our so Thank you. Okay, uh, next question is, uh, so does the agency match or recommend specific IVF clinics? So, yeah, we'll, if you don't, if you're not coming to us with one, we'll give you ones that um, we mostly work with. I think what's important about the ones we recommend is um, they're not as much focused on just normal infertility. A lot of great IVF doctors have their own practice and surrogacy isn't, or third-party reproduction isn't their focus whereas you want a clinic that is focused on that because they have relationships and know how to coordinate with our agencies. Another question is if we want to start off with twins, how much money should we have saved before you start? Um, if you look at the cost um, estimates um, on our website, I would say when you're needing a carrier and the donor, um, the rough cost estimate for twins, including all the IVF insurance, everything, probably about 100 $50,000, give or take maybe 10% um, on either side. And as I said, there's some additional costs that can come into play with twins, um, like bed rest or uh, added costs for the carrier, but roughly $150,000. Um, there's a bunch of questions all along the same lines about working with foreign donors, if it's possible, um, when would they, where would they be implanted, et cetera. 
Um, so it, it's most likely possible, but it would have to be done at a U.S. clinic. The reason being um, is they're going to have to go under all the different blood testing, et cetera, that is required under our uh, FDA here in the United States. Um, uh, people who create embryos abroad um, can't um, uh, ship them here usually because they didn't have the, the proper testing done, which is required here in the United States. Um, so um, probably a, a better topic to go in with the doctor, and we'll can send you Dr. Sahakian's contact information, but definitely possible it would have to occur. Um, at least retrieval would be done in the U.S. She could do all the medications abroad, but she'd have to actually get the retrieval done here and the blood testing done at a U.S. clinic. Okay, any more questions? We'll hang on the line for just a couple more minutes, and then we're just going to wrap things up. We're coming on uh, a little bit over an hour and a half now. So. Uh, so just last thing, there was an earlier question um, specifically about um, if uh, someone with um, hepatitis B can donate sperm, and the answer is yes, uh, as long as the um, recipient of the embryo in the end, the carrier, has had the hep B vaccine, um, a um, male donating sperm or a female with a hep B can uh, use their embryo. Um, so the question is about the, how difficult is that two embryos take, they make donor different sperm donor. Uh, I don't think it's, it's just a statistical reference. So with a good donor, um, roughly the, 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 the chance of having twins is in the 40% um, chance every time you donate embryos or every time you transfer embryos to embryos. Um, so it's like a 70% chance of pregnancy and inside that 70% chance, a 40% chance of twins. I'm not sure if Dr. Sagian touched on his specific uh, um, specific statistics, but I know last year it was something like 60% of his multiple embryo people had uh, got pregnant with twins. Uh, which state is good for traditional surrogacy? Um, it, it's, there's not many that are just good for traditional surrogacy. There's a lot of risks involved, and all parties would have to sign waivers. There's still states you can do traditional surrogacy, but it, they're not risk-free. In essence, your uh, carrier, et cetera, signs off on it, and then the legal work is done more like an adoption at the end because she's terminating her actual genetic parental rights. Um, we don't usually or rarely ever set them up because they are um, uh, fraught with risk, but if all the parties take on the risk, um, you know, it's something that can be done, but we wouldn't advise it. Does the unlimited IVF plan apply to me if I'm using my eggs and I'm 33 years of age? Uh, no, the unlimited IVF plan is specifically catered to people using uh, donors. Um, uh, you, however, working with many of the clinics, you can usually at least, you know, there's some type of deal structure they can put in place if you're using your own, something like you know, one set price for creating your embryos um, in the initial transfer and then a, you know, a la carte price for each transfer thereafter. You're not going to pay the full cost of the uh, of the IVF cost each time you transfer an embryo, it's going to be more like five thousand dollars per frozen transfer. So it won't be your cost won't be huge, but you can't work in the unlimited program. And there are actually some programs that allow you to do a fresh embryo, uh, a fresh egg retrieval, a fresh embryo transfer, and then any subsequent frozen embryo transfers until you've used up all of them for for one set price. Um, there, there are some companies out there, and we can get the names of them. That offer the question was, are there finance programs available? Um, there are some companies that offer um, loans for medical procedures, and they allow them for um, surrogacy as well. Um, 
uh, we can put you in touch with these companies if it's something you're interested in. Um, and, and some of the IVF clinics have finance options as well where they um, you know, will be paid out over time, things like that. Um, all the money isn't due at one time, just so you know. We, there's an initial payment to Circle to get you through matching. There's also a payment after you match. So it's, uh, payments themselves are not made all at once. Okay, so that's it for questions. Um, if you have any other questions you want to ask us, you can email Bruce Hale. Uh, his email address is on the screen. Or you can find all of our email addresses on our website under the About section if you want to email us directly. Uh, if you have a question about a medical concern, we can pass that along to Dr. Sahakian. Um, I want to thank everyone, all of our panelists, Alicia, uh, Dean, Dr. Sahakian, and Brian for joining us tonight, and also thank all of you for joining us. Again, you'll, you'll get an email with a PDF copy of these slides as well as a video recording of the webinar. Thanks again, and have a great night. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everybody.